Hello everyone. Okay, um, a, a situation for you. Imagine that I did something terribly wrong to you and uh, a terrible act which for which you're going to pay the consequences all of your life. That's serious. In other words, I really injured you. And imagine that with time, I acknowledge that, I come to the realization that I did something terrible to you. And I feel guilt about it. Wait, my, my feeling guilt is not going to help you. You're still suffering the consequences of that act. But beyond guilt, I might even feel remorse going a little bit further knowing that I have to do something in order to alleviate your pain in some sort of way. And I want to do that. And if you have a problem, I, I, I might want to help you. I want to, I want to make amends. I want to pay back in some sort of way for the wrong I did. I also feel shame, not only feel shame myself, but also shame because everyone in the neighborhood knows about it, what I did to you, my neighbor. So I'm fully conscious of this and I'm fully conscious of the wrong act that I did and I want to do something. Uh, the, the only thing that I know for sure is that I cannot undo what I did. So I'm left with this situation of feeling, acknowledging my act and wanted to, to, to bring some sort of closure. And I don't know how I'm trying to, to reach out to you. Now you have also choices. You might realize also, you might come to the, to the conclusion that Yes, you're still suffering the consequences of my action, but you can see that I am being sincere and honest and trying to, to do something, whatever I can about it now. And come to that realization yourself that you might, because I am sincere in my own pain, that you might want to extend your hand and then perhaps forgive, which is difficult enough. Or you may take another route and say, no, you are going to pay for what you did to me for the rest of your life. Uh, and, you, um, and you keep inflicting and pointing your finger, you did this to me and you did this to me, okay? And there is no moving away from that. You might even get to the point where knowing that I am sincere, you are using the your power over me now to even let's say blackmail me psychologically manipulate me because I know I'm being sincere okay no you did this and every time that no you remember what you did to me yeah okay these are the emotions perhaps that we might all feel in one way or another when we have done something wrong to others or when we something wrong has been done to us and dealing with these uh, feelings of guilt and and, and remorse and, and 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 shame and all these things i was thinking about this because i was listening to the um, uh, nicaragua taking germany to the international court of justice on account of germany being the second uh, provider of uh, weapons and arms to Israel and so on. I am aware because I was thinking <laughs> Germany is is uh, is in a tricky uh, situation here, isn't it? We are aware that they are that they felt the guilt of history to a large extent, and the, yeah. Um, and I know, I know the arguments, you know, that uh, you can say, well, yes, but I mean, just because they inflicted pain 
on, on the Jews in this particular case, okay, that doesn't give them the right to help these people to hurt other people who have nothing to do with it. That could be an argument. Another argument is to point out, look, there is a difference between the Jews, the Jews generally, or Judaism as a religion, okay, uh, and what Germany did was to the Jews, uh, and what is happening today, you've heard the arguments, you know, Zionism is different from uh, Judaism, Judaism is a religion, Zionism is a political ideology, and indeed many Jews actually, and many rabbis are also saying that uh, not in my name what Israel is doing. Many of them are speaking out and uh, some of them go as far as saying, you know, it's, it's not a, what they're doing is not a religion. In the name of our religion is uh, is actually using religion as a cover for a political ideology. That that that, uh, that uh, argument is is there. We could also say Germany could remain neutral and uh, just. I am aware of the arguments, but what I'm saying is that if you are Germany, how do you deal? It's a tricky situation uh, morally and so. Now, I was thinking about that when I remember a book that I had read quite a few years back, and uh, this is this is the book is um, the reader Bernhard Schlink. He's written other books. Terrific author. Terrific. Uh, anyway, this is a novel. And the novel, I'm going to tell you what the novel is about because the uh, protagonist uh, is going to have to deal with things that she had done in the past. As a matter of fact, she was, well, I won't tell you what she had done, um, but she has to deal with something that she had done and how to deal with it much later on. Okay, so the story is about this. It starts with uh, this little boy who is a sickly boy, and uh, he uh, uh, one day on his way to school, he's a sickly boy, and then he uh, he gets ill, uh, he he get, uh, gets sick, and uh, he starts vomiting in the street, and then he he has to sit down there in the middle of the street, and uh, he faints, and uh, anyway, this woman comes out of her very tiny well. We don't know it's a tiny apartment yet. It comes out of her apartment and helps him out and uh, takes him home, cleans him up, makes sure he's okay, um, gives him a cup of tea. And then uh, when he, she feels that he's fine, uh, where do you live? I live in... The, okay, so she goes with him to her, to his house and, uh, and, and leaves, okay? And he tells this what happened to his parents. And his mother says, well, um, that was very good, don't, don't forget, you must go again and, uh, and um, find out where she lives in that apartment and uh, perhaps take her a bunch of flowers and say thank you and so on. And he does that. He finds out where this lady lives, in which apartment in that building. And then something happens because he's only about nine the woman gets undressed kind of in front of him at this point we don't know whether she's doing it on purpose in order to perhaps um, you know <laughs> uh, shock the child or uh, you know but probably not probably she's not even aware that he's looking in any case he's a little boy so he won't take any notice of that okay it's a tiny apartment and she is undressing in the kitchen and this is how the author puts it um, as he was ready to leave she says to him Wait, she said as I got up to go. I have to leave too, and I'll walk with you. I waited in the hall while she changed her clothes in the kitchen. The door was open a crack. She took off the smock and stood there in the bright green slip. 
This was the time, this is in the 50s, when women still wore girdles and stockings and slips under the uh, dress. Two stockings were hanging over the back of the chair, but look at this little boy, nine years old. Picking one up, she gathered it into a roll using one hand, then the other, then balanced on one leg as she rested her heel, the heel of her foot, of her other foot against her knee, leaned forward, slipped the rolled up stocking over the tip of her foot, put her foot on the chair as she smoothed the stocking up over her calf, knee and thigh, then bent to one side as she fastened the stocking to the garter belt. Straightening up, she took her foot off the chair and reached for the other stocking. I couldn't take my eyes off her. Her neck and shoulders, her breasts, which the slip veiled rather than concealed. Her hips with stretched the slip tight as she propped her foot on her knee and then set it on the chair. Her leg pale and naked, then shimmering in the silky stocking. She felt me looking at her. As she was reaching for the other stocking, she paused, turned towards the door and looked straight at me. I can't describe what kind of look it was. Surprised? Skeptical? Knowing? Reproachful? I turned red. For a fraction of a second I stood there, my face burning. Then I couldn't take it any more. I fled out of the apartment, down the stairs and into the street. He kept going back and eventually by the age he's 15 he this develops into an intimate relationship which is very active but one of the things that she asked him to do always was to read to her before any, anything else and uh, he would read all kinds of books you know for about uh, half an hour three quarters of an hour and then this thing about reading it's going to become an issue later on probably that is the the reader okay the reader is the guy the protagonist okay so after that first incident for the rest of those um, five years or so he started uh, fantasizing, having fantasies, okay. He was actually, he became infatuated with her. And he says, as days went on, I discovered that I couldn't stop thinking sinful thoughts, in which case I also wanted the sin itself. I said to myself that it was more dangerous not to go to see her because I was running the risk then of becoming trapped in my own fantasies. So the way to do away with the fantasies, he thought, I, was, I, would, I would go to her. That was the right thing. Silencing, he says, silencing my bad conscience. The woman was a streetcar conductor, a, uh, a bus conductor. You remember when we had the drivers and the uh, the conductors which run the bell, yeah? All right. So um, what happened next? Well, eventually you know what is going to happen, that he, he has a very intimate relationship and very passionate with her for a long time. And now he is 15, he's at his uh, school, and he finds that this relationship actually gave, gives him a lot of self-confidence as a young man. In other words, he goes to school and he feels confident and grown up and so on. He doesn't even bother to look at the other girls who feel his self-confidence and even arrogance at 
sometimes and they are all attracted to him and he is not interested in the least so he feels very grown up and very confident and of course it had to happen that eventually he gets uh, not tired he's still infatuated with this woman but he starts looking out to other beautiful young girls in the, the, in the school and he feels that he is betraying her now and in how does he explain this then I began to betray her not that I gave away any secrets or exposed Hannah I didn't reveal anything that I should have kept to myself instead I kept something to myself that I should have revealed to her. I didn't acknowledge her. I know that in front of other people, I know that this avowal is an unusual form of betrayal. From the outside, it is impossible to tell if you are disowning someone or simply for example, if you ignore her, when you see her in the streets, let's say, um, from the outside, it is impossible to tell if you're disowning someone or simply exercising discretion or being considerate or avoiding embarrassments and uh, sources of irritation. But you who are doing the disowning, you know what you're doing. And this avowal pulls the underpinnings away from a relationship just as surely as other more flamboyant types of betrayal. She begins to act very oddly. All of a sudden she's very upset and then she's so right and then she gets upset for the littlest things and so on oddly behavior he doesn't know why then one day he is swimming in the swimming pool and uh, he looks up and there she is um, this is how he the author says it um, she was standing 20 or 30 meters away in shorts and an open blouse knotted at the waist looking at me i looked back at her she was too far away for me to read her expression i didn't jump to my feet and run to her questions raised through my head why was she at the pool did she want to be seen with me did I want to be seen with her? Why had we never met each other by accident? What should I do? Then I stood up, and in that briefest of moments in which I took my eyes off her, she was gone. Hannah in shorts, with the tails of her blouse knotted, her face turned towards me but with an expression I cannot read at all. That is another picture I have of her. And she disappeared completely. He could not find her. He went to the apartment the next day. No, the landlord said no, she's left. Didn't know what happened. And the next thing is the next time I saw her, it was in a courtroom. He did not miss one day of the trial. What happened? A woman <coughs> had written, a young lady had written a book about what had happened in one of the uh, camps, the uh, prisoners camps, the Jews. <coughs> They were being taken from one uh, uh, camp to another and all of a sudden it started raining 
<clears throat> the prisoners and the guards took refuge in one church. Then lightning that set fire to the steeple of the church. The, the prisoners were locked inside the church by the guards and the church burnt to a cinder and all the prisoners there burnt inside. The guards were not inside. They did not burn, they did not die. And this young lady wrote this book about it and it became uh, common knowledge to everybody and so now there was a trial. The guards were being taken, were being tried for having allowed all those prisoners to be burnt alive and having done nothing about it. By this time the protagonist of the book is a university, his law student. He had never seen her. She had disappeared. Um, and one of the professors said that they are, what, the, what they had to do was to, for research, was to attend these trials of these guards during the Nazi period and uh, take notes and then they would uh, discuss it during class about what happened and what had, uh, and so on. Okay, so he is one of these students and he has to go to these trials. And lo and behold, one of the women is Hannah. And she is, <laughs> she is there and he cannot comprehend what? Was she a guard during the Nazi period? at one of these concentration camps. Couldn't believe it. How could it be? Well, let me find, um, let me find the right page, 115 here. While they are questioning all the guards, Every one of the guards has a story. I didn't know, I didn't have the keys, I didn't know what to do, I was just following orders, it just so happened that I was outside, I could have been inside myself, I didn't, I, I did, you know, it's not my fault, but everyone had a story. Hannah is the only one who seems to be telling the truth of what happened. She tells the story of how uh, the, her bosses told them, you uh, wait here, uh, we are going to, we'll, we'll come back, and then the, uh, the lightning and the fire, and then there were no keys. And the, Anyway, she seemed to be able to be the one who's taken some kind of responsibility, saying, yes, I mean, we were the guards, and we were outside, and uh, we didn't open the doors. Why didn't you open the door? I didn't have the keys, but why could, uh, couldn't you have, who had the keys? Uh, but anyway, in her manner, she seems to be trying to tell the truth, not to tell the story to say I'm not guilty or anything, but um, yeah, you know, it happened. I, I, I just don't, I didn't know what to do, that, that kind of thing. So this is one of the lawyers. Um, you stated that you knew you were sending the prisoners to their deaths. That was only true of you, wasn't it? You cannot know what your other colleagues knew. Because he kept saying, we didn't know what to do. No, 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 no. The others were now saying that she was in charge. She was the one who gave the orders. They were trying to get out of it. and because she was the one who didn't seem too prepared or too, uh, she hadn't been counseled perhaps enough or hadn't read the, 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 uh, the charges. The other, the other guards began to point at her. It was her, we were just following orders, but her, and she didn't have, she didn't have a good explanation of, okay. So she says, 
When you say we, you mean I, don't you? Don't try to spread your guilt to everybody else. They were just following orders. It was you, wasn't it? So here's the lawyer. You stated that you knew you were sending the prisoners to their deaths. That was only true of you, wasn't it? You cannot know what your colleagues knew. Perhaps you can guess at it, but in the final analysis, you cannot judge. Is that not so? Hannah was asked by one of the other defendants' lawyers. And she says, well, but we, we all knew that saying we, we all, is easier than saying I, I alone, isn't it? Isn't it true that you and only you had special prisoners in the camp, young girls? First one for a period and then another? She's going to be accused now of having favorites and abusing them. Hannah hesitated. I don't think I was the only one who, you dirty liar, your favorites, you had favorites, didn't you? All that was just you, no one else. Then another of the accused, a coarse woman, uh, said, um, a, a, a coarse woman, not unlike a fat broody hem, but with a spiteful tongue, was vis visibly worked up. Is it possible that when you say new, the most you can actually do, that you all knew, is that the most that you can actually do is assume and that when you say believe, you're actually just making things up. The lawyer shook his head, as if disturbed by her acknowledgement of this. And is it also true that once you were tired of your special prisoners, they all went back to Auschwitz with the next transport? Hannah did not answer. That was your special, your personal selection, wasn't it? You don't want to remember. You want to hide behind something that everyone did, but then the survivor who had written the book said, oh God. The daughter who had taken a seat in the public benches after being examined, covered her face with her hands. How could I have forgotten? The presiding judge asked if she wished to add anything to her testimony. She did not wait to be called to the front. She stood up and spoke from her seat among the spectators. Yes, she had favorites. Always one of the young ones who was weak and delicate. And she took them under her wing and made sure that they didn't have to work like the rest of us and got them better barracks space and took care of them and fed them better and in the evening she had them brought to her and the girls were never allowed to say what she did with them in the evenings and we assumed that she was well also because they all ended up on the transports as if she had had her fun with them and then had got bored. They all ended up going to the, to the transports. But it wasn't like that at all and one day one of them finally talked and we learned that the girls read aloud to her evening after evening after evening. Well, that was better than if they, um, if you ask me, and better than working themselves to death in the building site. I must have thought, uh, I must have thought it, it was better or I couldn't have forgotten it. But was it better? And then she sat down. Hannah turned around and looked at me. Her eyes found me at once and I realized that she had known the whole time I was there. She just looked at me. 
Her face didn't ask for anything, beg for anything, assured me of anything or promise anything. It simply presented itself. I saw how tense and exhausted she was. She had circle under her eyes and on each cheek a line that ran from top to bottom uh, that I had never seen before, that went yet deep but already marked, marked her like scars. When I turned red under her gaze, she turned away and back to the judge's bench. The presiding judge asked the lawyer who had cross-examined Hannah if he had any further questions for the defendant. He also asked Hannah's lawyer. And then I thought, ask her, please ask her. He wanted the lawyer to keep asking her questions. Ask her if she chose the weak and delicate girls because they could never have stood up to the work on the building site anyway, because they would have been sent on the next transport to Aswich in any case, and because she wanted to make that final month bearable. Say it, Hannah. Say you wanted to make their last month bearable, that that was the reason for choosing the delicate and the weak that there was no other reason and could not be. But the lawyer did not ask Hannah and she did not speak of her own accord. Okay, so um, okay let me go here now. Then there is something about a report. All the other defendants um, are now ganging up on her, as I said, that she was the leader and so on. She was the one who wrote all the reports anyway. So continuing with the trial, did you write the report? We all discuss, she says, we all discuss what we should write. We didn't want to hang any of the blame on the ones who had left, but we didn't want to attract charges that we had done anything wrong either. This is about the church and the fire. So you're saying you talked it through together. Who wrote it? And then one of the other defendants say, you. The other defendant pointed at Hannah. No, I didn't write it. Anyway, does it matter who it did? A prosecutor suggested that an expert be called to compare the handwriting in the report and the handwriting of the defendant, Hannah Schmidt. My handwriting? Do you want my handwriting? The judge, the prosecutor and Hannah's lawyer discussed whether a person's handwriting retained its character over more than 15 years and can be identified. Hannah listened and tried several times to say or ask something and was becoming increasingly alarmed. And then she said, You don't have to call an expert. I admit that I wrote the report. Okay. So what happened here? What he realized was that Hannah actually was hiding something. Hannah was illiterate. Hannah could not read and could not write. That is why he went back all those readings that he had done to her. The fact that these little girls would also come and read in to her. The fact that as she told him the story of uh, her life, she omitted that, but it always seemed that whenever she was promo she was uh, going to be promoted, she would move to another place and disappear. She didn't want to go through the fact that she had to admit and let others know that she could not read or write. Uh, 
And now she could not admit that she was illiterate and she would rather say, yes, it was me. She would rather be a criminal than to be an illiterate. And this is how the author deals with it. How often I have asked myself these same questions both then and since. If Hannah's motives was fear of exposure, why opt for the horrible exposure as a criminal over the harmless exposure as an illiterate? Or did she believe she could escape exposure altogether? Was she simply stupid? And was she vain enough and evil enough to become a criminal simply to avoid exposure? Both then and since, I have always rejected this. No, Hannah had not decided in favour of crime. She had decided against the promotion at Siemens in the past and fell into a job as a guard. They came to recruit from the factory at Siemens to, be, to make them supervisors and rather than become a supervisor, they uh, she she uh, th they were going to promote her and rather than that she joined the guards and accepted a job as a guard and no she had not dispatched the delicate and the weak on transports to Auschwitz because they had read to her she had chosen them to read to her because she wanted to make their last month bearable before their inevitable dispatch to Auschwitz. And no, at the trial, Hannah did not weigh exposure as an illiterate against exposure as a criminal. We're dealing with shame here, yeah? She did not calculate and she did not maneuver. She accepted that she would be called to account and simply did not wish to endure further exposure. She was not pursuing her own interest, but fighting for her own truth, her own justice. Because she always had to dissimulate somewhat and could never be completely candid, it was a pitiful truth, of course, and a pitiful justice, but it was hers and the struggle for it was her struggle. She must have been completely exhausted. Her struggle was not limited to the trial. She was struggling as she always had struggled not to show what she could, not, what she could do, not to show what she could do, but to hide what she couldn't do a life made up of advances that were actually frantic retreats and victories that were concealed defeats. Okay. Once Hannah admitted having written the report, the other defendants had an easy game to play. When Hannah had not been acting alone, they claimed she had pressured, threatened and forced the others. She had seized command. She did the talking and the writing. She had made all the decisions. Okay. And so now he who's thinking these thoughts uh, that um, the fact is that the, the woman is illiterate wonders whether it is his responsibility responsibility to go and tell the judge it may not change the verdict that she was guilty as a guard for what she did or but it would have been a different thing. In other words, perhaps the uh, the punishment will be lighter than if she was the one giving all the orders and writing all the reports, right? So 
I had had enough, too, but I couldn't put it behind me. For me, the proceedings were not ending, but just beginning. I had been a spectator, and then suddenly a participant, a player and a member of the jury. I had never sought nor chosen this new role, but it was mine, whether I wanted it or not, where I did anything or just remained completely passive, because she is uh, sentenced to life imprisonment. Did anything, there was only one thing to do. I could go to the judge and tell him that Hannah was illiterate, that she was not the main protagonist and guilty party the way the others made her out to be, that her behaviour at the trial was not proof of singular incorrigibility or lack of remorse or arrogance, but was born of her incapacity to familiarise herself with the indictment and the manuscript and also probably of a consequent, lu consequent lack of any sense of strategy or tactics, that her defence had been significantly compromised, that she was guilty, but not as guilty as it appeared. Maybe I would not be able to convince the judge, but I would give him enough to have to think about and investigate further. In the end, it would be proved that I was right, and Hannah would be punished, but less severely. She would have to go to prison, but would be released sooner. Wasn't that what she had been fighting for? Yes. That was what she had been fighting for, but she was not willing to earn victory at the price of exposure as an illiterate. Nor would she want me to barter her self-image for a few years in prison. She could have made that kind of trade herself and did not, which meant she didn't want it. Her sense of self was worth more than the years in prison to her. But was it really worth all that? What did she gain from this false self-image which ensnared her and crippled her and paralyzed her? With the energy she put into maintaining the lie, she could have learned to read and write long ago. Okay. He did go to see the judge. And this is what happened. I did go to the presiding judge after all. I couldn't make myself visit Hannah in prison, but neither could I endure doing nothing. The judge knew about our seminar group and was happy to invite me to come and talk after a session in court. I knocked, was invited in, greeted and offered the chair in front of his desk. He was sitting in his shirt sleeves uh, behind, uh, behind it. His robe hung over the back and arms of his chair. He had sat down in the robe and then slipped out of it. He seemed relaxed, a man who had finished his day's work and was content. Without the irritated expression he hid behind during the trial, he had a nice, intelligent, harmless, civil servant's face. He made general easy uh, chit-chat, asking me about this and that, what our seminar group thought of the trial, what our professor intended to do with the trial record, which semester we were in, which semester I was in, why I was studying law and when I planned to take my exams. He told me I must be sure to register for the exams on time. I answered all his questions. Then I listened while he talked about his studies and his exams. He had done everything the right way. He had taken the right classes and seminars at the right time and had passed his final exams with the right degree of success. 
He liked being a lawyer and a judge, and if he had to do it all over again, he would do it the same way. And then he said, let's go. And, and they left. And he never put it to the judge. So he's dealing with that too. The verdict was handed down at the end of June. Hannah was sentenced to life. The others received terms in jail. And then then he says, he goes on to explain how much later on his generation in Germany in the 50s and 60s actually blamed their parents for what they had done or had not done or ignored or looked away and so a new generation of Germans rebelled against their parents for what had happened and he says Pointing at the guilty parties, however, did not free us from shame. The next generation, knowing what had happened, still carried the shame. Pointing at the guilty parties did not free us from shame, but at least it overcame the suffering we went through on account of it. It converted the passive suffering of shame into energy, activity, aggression. They have to do something. They cannot just be neutral. They, it turned into that shame became aggression towards the parents. Okay. And then he goes on with the story he never visited her in prison, but knowing that she could not read nor write, she, uh, he, he, uh, he started, because sometimes he couldn't sleep at night, and uh, he read books, he got the idea of actually recording books and sending the tapes to her. And he did that, and for about eight years, Every two weeks or so, he would send her tapes. He found out where she was and would send her tapes. There was no letter, there was no how are you or anything, just the reading of the tapes. Okay. He had to do something because he says at one point, escape involves not just running away, but arriving somewhere. Now let's see what happens. 18 years uh, had passed and one day he receives a letter from the warden of the prison. Hannah is going to be released after all. And this is the letter that he receives from the warden. For years, you and Frau Schmidt have corresponded with each other. Oh yes, because at one point, many years later, she actually sent a little note with, she was actually learning how to write. And, the, and he goes at great length explaining about the writing. It's like a child's writing when, when you first learn how to write. You know, one letter is big, the other is small all over the place. It was, it was obvious that she was learning how to write. And then it got a little bit better. It never really got too great, not that he was judging her anyway, but he says it's like our great grandparents that didn't write too much. Um, a kind of, uh, a, the type of writing of a person who doesn't write a lot anyway, but it had got better. But this is the, the, the letter that he receives from the warden. For years, you and Frau Schmidt have corresponded with each other. 
This is the only contact Frau Schmidt has with the outside world. And so I am turning to you, although I do not know how close your relationship is and whether you are a relative or a friend. Next year, Frau Schmidt will again make an appeal for clemency, and I expect the parole board to grant the appeal. She will then be released quite shortly after 18 years in prison. Of course, we can find or try to find her an apartment and a job. A job will be difficult at her age, even though she is in excellent health and has shown great skill in our sewing shop. But rather than us taking care of her, it would be better for relatives or friends to do so, to have the released prisoner live nearby and keep her company and give her support. You cannot imagine how lonely and helpless one can be on the outside after 18 years in prison. Frau Schmidt can take care of herself quite well and manages on her own. It would be enough if you could find her a small apartment and a job, visit her and invite her to your house occasionally during the first weeks and months and make sure she knows about the programs offered by the local congregations, adult education, family support groups and so on. It is not easy after 18 years to go into the city for the first time, go shopping, deal with the authorities, go to a restaurant. Doing it with someone else helps. I have noticed that you do not visit Frau Schmidt. If you did, I would not have written to you but would have asked uh, to talk to you during one of your visits. Now it seems as if you will have to visit her before she is released. Please come and see me at that opportunity. Long story short, he still uh, he still prevaricates for a, for quite a few months. He feels very uncomfortable about going to the prison to visit her. But anyway, the time is getting near, and uh, he does eventually go and visit her. She has changed much, white hair, terribly overweight, totally a different woman. The warden explained, explained to him that actually she had taken great care of herself and uh, she actually had great authority up to a year ago authority with the other prisoners. They would ask her for uh, advice. They, uh, she, she, she was doing very, very well looking after herself and so on. But in this last year when she knew that, you know, the parole uh, meeting was coming up, she didn't know why, but it seemed that um, she changed completely. She wouldn't wash, for example. She would even smell sometimes. That wasn't Hannah. Um, a, 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 a change in this last year. Why? She didn't know, but that was it. Any, anyway, she he went to, to visit her and everything was arranged. Uh, he asked a friend of a friend who had a little room studio apartment. She got her an apartment, made it a little bit nice and so on. Then his tailor was looking for a woman who could sew and okay, found her a job. Everything had been organized. And then on the day he went to pick her up, The night before, she killed herself in her own cell. Let me tell you how, let me read you how. Next morning, Hannah was dead. She had hung herself at daybreak. 
When I arrived, I was taken to the warden. I saw her for the first time, a small, thin woman with dark blonde hair and glasses. She seemed insignificant until she began to speak, with force and warmth, and a severe gaze and energetic use of both hands and arms. She asked me about my telephone conversation of the night before with Hannah, when he told her that everything was arranged, he would be there the next morning, and the meeting the previous week. Had I picked up any signals? Had it made me fear for her? I said no. Indeed, I had had no suspicions or fears uh, that I had ignored. How did you get to know each other? We lived in the same neighborhood. She looked at me searchingly, and I saw that I would have to say more. We lived in the same neighborhood, and we got to know each other and became friends. When I was a young student, I was at the trial that convicted her. Why did you send Frau Schmidt cassettes? Recordings. I was silent. You knew that she was illiterate, didn't you? How did you know? I shrugged my shoulders. I didn't see what business the story of Hannah and me was of hers. Tears were filling my chest and throat and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to speak. I didn't want to cry in front of her. Anyway, uh, She must have seen how I was feeling. Come with me. I'll show you Frau Smith's cell. She went ahead but kept turning around to tell me things or explain them to me. Here is where there had been a terrorist attack. Here was the sewing shop where Hannah had worked. This is where Hannah once held a sit-down strike until cuts in library funding were reinstated. This was the way to the library. She stopped in front of the cell. Frau Schmitz didn't pack. You'll see herself the way she lived in it. Bed, closet, table, chair, a shelf on the wall over the table, a sink and a toilet in the corner behind the door, glass bricks instead of window glass. The table was bare. The shelf held books, an alarm clock, stuffed bear, two mugs, instant coffee, tea things, the cassette machine, and on two lower shelves, the cassettes I had made. They aren't all here, I said. The warden had followed my glance. Frau Schmidt always lent some tapes to the AIDS Society for Blind Prisoners. All right, there is a picture, this is rather long uh, description, but uh, one she had one picture of a um, newspaper, a, a cutting from a new newspaper with a young man and an older man congratulating each other. Obviously, uh, um, uh, when you a uh, graduation ceremony and the young man was himself. So she obviously saw it in some place and clipped it there and was there on the wall. Anyway, she did not leave a note for him or for anybody else. But she, the only thing she left was not a personal note to, to him, but uh, she left a note saying that she wanted him to be the execution, uh, ex not executioner, executor of uh, her will, as it were. She had 7,000 francs in the bank that she had never touched, and she also had this tin. And in this tin, there were personal 
very personal things. There was an earring and there was a note uh, to someone and uh, just just nicks and knacks of personal things that she kept in this tin with a note saying that she wanted him to give it to that young lady, the survivor. The money and the tin. Now, the survivor was now living in New York and so he goes to New York. Let me see if I can find it. It was autumn before I could carry out Hannah's instructions. The daughter lived in New York and I used a meeting in Boston as the occasion to bring her the money. A bank check plus the tea tin with the cash. Oh, there was, uh, there was some money there too in the tin. Coins. I had written to her, introduced myself as a legal historian and mentioned the trial. I told her I would be grateful for a chance to talk to her. She invited me to tea. I took the train from Boston to New York. Goes on and then he says, the daughter lived in New York on a street near Central Park. The street was lined on both sides with old ro row houses of dark sandstone with stoops on the same sandstone leading up to the front door on the first floor. This created an effect of severity, house after house with almost identical facades, stoop after stoop, trips, uh, trees only recently planted at regular intervals along the sidewalk with a few yellowing leaves on thin twigs, the daughter served tea by large windows looking out on the west pocket backyard gardens, some green and colorful and some merely collections of trash. As soon as we had sat down, the tea had been poured and the sugar added and stirred. She switched from the English in which she had welcomed me to German. What brings you here? The question was neither, neither friendly nor unfriendly. Her tone was absolutely matter-of-fact. Everything about her was matter-of-fact. Her manner, her gestures, her dress. Her face was oddly ageless, the way faces look after being lifted. But perhaps it had set because of her early sufferings. I tried and failed to remember her face as he had been during the trial. I told her about Hannah's death and her last wishes. Why me? I suppose because you are the only survivor. And how am I supposed to deal with it? However you think fit. And Grant Fry Smith, her absolution now? At first I wanted to protest, but Hannah was indeed asking a great deal. Her years of imprisonment were not merely to be the required atonement. Hannah wanted to give them her own meaning, and she wanted this giving of meaning to be recognised. I said as much. She shook her head. I didn't know if this meant she was refusing to accept my interpretation or refusing to grant Hannah the recognition. I said, could you not recognize it without granting her absolution? She laughed. You like her, don't you? What was your relationship? I hesitated a moment. 
I read aloud to her. It started when I was 15 and continued while she was in prison. How did you... I sent her tapes. Frau Schmidt was illiterate almost all her life. She only learned to read and write in prison. Why do you do all this? When I was 15, we had a relationship. You mean you slept together? Yes. That woman was truly brutal. Did you get over the fact that you were only 15 when she... No, you said yourself that you began reading to her again when she was in prison. Did you ever get married? Yes, he had got married and had a daughter and then divorced and the usual thing. I nodded. And the marriage was short and unhappy and you never married again. And the child, if there is one, is in boarding school, right? That's true of thousands of people. It doesn't take a Frau Schmidt. Did you ever feel when you had contact with her in those last years that she knew what she had done to you? I shrugged my shoulders. In any case, she knew what she had done to people in the camp and on the march. She didn't just tell me that, she dealt with it intensively during her last years in prison. And I told her what the warden had said. She stood up and took long strides up and down the room. How much money is it? I went to the coat closet where I had left my bag and returned with the check and the tea tin. Here. She looked at the check and put it on the table. She opened the tin emptied it, closed it again, and held it in her hands. Her eyes riveted on it. When I was a little girl, I had a tea tin for my treasures. Not like this, although these sh sorts of tea tins already existed but one with Cyrillic letters, not one with the top you push in, but one you snap shut. I brought it with me to the camp, but then one day it was stolen from me. What was in it? What do you expect? A piece of hair from our poodle? Tickets to the opera my father took me to? A ring I won somewhere or found in a package. The tin wasn't stolen for, for what was in it. The tin itself and what could be done with it were worth a lot in the camp. She put the tin down on top of the check. Do you have a suggestion for what to do with the money? she asked him. Using it for something to do with the Holocaust would really seem like an absolution to me, and that is something I neither wish nor care to grant. For illiterates who want to learn to read and write, There must be non-profit organizations, foundations, societies you could give the money to. She said, I'm sure there are. And then she thought about it. Are there corresponding Jewish organizations? You can depend on it. If there are organizations for something, then there are Jewish organizations for it. Illiteracy, it has to be admitted, is hardly a Jewish problem. She puts the check and the money back to me. Let's do it in this way. You find out what kind of relevant Jewish organizations there are, here or in Germany, 
and you pay the money to the account of the organization that seems most plausible to you. Then she laughed. If the recognition is so important, all right, you can do it in the name of Hannah Schmidt. She picked up the tin again. I'll keep the tin. Okay, so that is the story. Eventually, this is my own interpretation, of course. I think eventually she gave her absolution. I think eventually she granted her forgiveness. And so perhaps Hannah in her grave and she herself were after all reconciled. The problem is when we cannot get to that reconciliation. Yes. Well, I'll let you to, to think about it if you wish. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.